So air resistance is a force that opposes an object's mo motion through any you know, fluid. Remember, a fluid is a gas or a, a liquid. So it's also called fluid resistance for this reason. So, so far, you know, we usually ignore air resistance in any problems because including air resistance makes it significantly harder. So the basic fact about air resistance is that, again, it's opposite to the motion, which means it's always in the, or usually in the direction directly opposite the velocity vector. And also it's directly proportional to the velocity. So the magnitude of the air resistance force is a constant times the velocity. So in most situations, the air resistance on an object can be split into two components. One component is called the linear component and one is the quadratic. So the linear is proportional to just the velocity and the quadratic is proportional to the velocity squared. And so the linear and quadratic components of air resistance, you know, arise from for different reasons and they have different properties. So the linear resistance is mostly due to the viscosity of the fluid that the object is moving through. And then the quadratic resistance is due to the inertia of the medium. Say you're moving forward, then now the air in front of you has to go somewhere. You know, your molecules can't just replace the air molecules, so the, you have to move the air molecules out of the way. And so basically, while you're moving through a medium, you have to accelerate the particles in front of you so that you can move forward. You know, the space in front of you has to move out of the way. So that creates some drag because in the medium if you're exerting some force on the medium in front of you, then that means the medium is exerting some force back on you. So the linear component of the drag is more prominent for slower and smaller objects, whereas the quadratic component is more important for faster and larger objects. And then the linear component depends on the linear size, which is basically just the length, and then the quadratic component depends on the cross-sectional size, of the object. So we're going to look at a special case where the object is a sphere. So in that case, the the two constants, remember B is the constant of the linear velocity, I mean linear air resistance, and C is the constant of the quadratic air resistance. These constants can be approximated in terms of the diameter of the sphere object. So B is approximated as a constant times the diameter, and c is approximated as the constant times the diameter squared. Again, because the diameter represents the linear size of the sphere, and the diameter squared represents the cross-sectional size. So with this approximation, we can see the ratio of the quadratic to linear components for any sphere. So this ratio is going to be a constant times the diameter times the velocity. So here you can see why the when you have a bigger object or a faster object, then this ratio is going to be larger, which means the quadratic is more important than the linear factor. If the ratio is very small, you know, the diameter is very small or the velocity is very small, then the linear is going to be much more important than the quadratic. So many times we can just ignore one and take the other. Either take the quadratic or just the linear. You know, but for some objects you have to take both because this ratio is pretty it's gonna be pretty even. So we're gonna solve Newton's second law for an object in free fall with linear air resistance. So first of all, since the air resistance depends on your velocity, as you are falling down, you know, your speed is increasing. So as your speed increases the the air resistance increases, and so eventually the force of the air resistance is going to be equal to the force of gravity on the object. And so at that point, the net force becomes zero, and so the object stops accelerating. It maintains a constant speed. And we can solve for this constant speed by just setting gravity mg equal to bv, the drag. 
So this final constant speed of the object is equal to mg over b, and we call this the terminal velocity. And in this video, I'm going to be denoting it with a little t under the v. So now we're ready to solve using second law for an object in free fall. So the net force, right, so we're going to take down to be the positive direction. So the net force is going to be mg minus bv. And we'll set that equal to mass times acceleration. So notice how I wrote the acceleration as the derivative of velocity. So now we have an equation that involves the derivative of velocity and velocity itself on the left side. And so this kind of equation, when we have the derivative of some quantity and the quantity itself in the same equation, is called a differential equation. The goal is to solve for the velocity as a function of time. So this differential equation is a special type of differential equation called a separable differential equation, which means we can basically just move all the v's to one side and all the t's to one side and then integrate both sides. So first thing I did is divide both sides by the mass. So now I'm going to name this constant, this curly t, as m over b. And that's so we don't have to keep writing m over b over and over again. And the reason I did m over b instead of b over m, you'll see later. So b over m times v becomes v divided by the curly t. So now we separate the variables. So we just divide both sides by this expression because the g and the curly t are just constants. And then we, move, we sort of move the dt to the other side. So to integrate both sides, we're going to need to use a u substitution, where u is going to be equal to g minus v over curly t. And so when we integrate, this is going to become you know, negative curly t times the natural log of all that on the bottom. And on the other side, we have t, and then of course, the c. So we're going to divide both sides by negative curly t, and c divided by negative curly t is just another constant, because curly t is a constant as well. So we can just absorb it into the constant and make a new constant, which is denoted by the c prime. So next what we have to do is take e to the power of both sides, and I'm going to show it in more detail because I forgot to do it in the initial recording. So it's called exponentiating both sides of the equation. You take e, and then you take both sides of the equation as exponents for these new e's. So you know, if you remember, e to the ln of anything is just going to be that something. It gives to the ln. And then if we have two things being added in the exponent, then remember we can split it up as multiplication. And then e to the c is just a constant. So we can make it a new constant, which is c double prime. So next what we're going to do is solve for the c by setting t equal to 0. So at t equal to 0, e to the negative t over curly t is equal to 1. And then the velocity is equal to the initial velocity of the object. So now that we have t, I mean, we have c now. So we can plug the value of c in. So Notice how I just distributed it right away. So now we, now we want to solve for v. You know, that's what we're after the whole time. v as a function of t. So I'm going to multiply both sides by the curly t. So now notice how g times the curly t is really just equal to the terminal velocity that we talked about earlier. So I'm going to write the terminal velocity instead of g times the curly t now. Now we have an answer, you know, the velocity as a function of time. So before we move on to the position function, we're going to talk about a few properties of this velocity function. So you can see as t approaches infinity, then e to the negative t over you know, the curly t is approaching 0. So then the velocity as a whole 
approaches the terminal velocity. And also, you know, this is the reason for the curly T, if the initial velocity is zero, then the, the function simplifies to you know, the terminal velocity times one minus e to negative t over curly t. And so we can see when time is equal to the curly t, then the velocity, you know, it's one minus one over e times the terminal velocity. So this turns out to be around 63% of the terminal velocity. So if an object starts at rest, then after a time equal to curly t, it reaches 63% of its final velocity. And so you'll see this type of constant pop up in many different situations. Now it's often called a time constant. So the time constant gets a sense of how fast it's going to increase to its maximum value. So you know, the smaller that the time constant is, the faster it's going to increase to its terminal velocity. And so last step, we're going to find the position function by integrating this velocity function. So for the, the terminal velocity, we stick a t on the end, and then we use a u substitution for the second term. We, we make u equal to negative t over the time constant, and then of course we add a c on the end. So we've, and then we've, we solve for c by setting t equal to zero. Now here we're saying that the initial position is equal to zero. So we can solve for t then. And now, now that we have t, well the last step is just to you know, clean the expression up a bit by factoring some stuff out. And then here we have a final equation for the motion of an object in free fall with linear air resistance.